stands at the podium and addresses the bench. And the arguments are delivered to a judge or a number of judges who sit on the panel. Judges on the panel or three. Three judges is typical for an appellate level oral argument or for a moot court competition. If there are three judges on the panel, you would refer to one judge as your honor and the entire panel as your honors. Oral arguments are timed, so someone has to keep track of how long the oralist has been speaking. That person is referred to as the bailiff. The court and the oralist can see the time signals. Time is kept via time cards, which let the oralist and the court know how much time is remaining in the oral argument. They are usually broken down into increments, such as five minutes are remaining, two minutes are remaining, one minute is remaining, and a stop sign to let the court and the oralist know when time is completed. You may be wondering what to wear at your oral argument. You should dress in a fairly formal way. Nothing too flashy, nothing that's too distracting. Men should wear a suit, and women should follow the same dress code that they would follow at a very formal conservative law firm or on a job interview to such a law firm. Cut. A skirt, but even it is fairly casual for an oral argument. You really should wear a suit, but even this color shirt is a little too bright for an oral argument. What we're really getting at is don't wear anything that will distract the judges from your oral argument and let them think about things like, why are they wearing that? Women should avoid large or flashy jewelry or anything that actually might bang against the podium, making a noise that will distract the judges. Certainly you don't want to wear anything that's very humorous, such as a loud, funny tie. You may be wondering what to bring to your oral argument. The idea is to bring enough material so that you can keep track of your argument, but also don't bring something that's too cluttered or too awkward so that you can refer to it neatly and quietly during your oral argument. Probably the best thing to use is an oral, argu an oral argument folder, such as the one I'm showing here. In this folder, you can see that the center is an outline of your oral argument. And along the side, we have cards that can be flipped up. On these cards, you would put down some information about questions that you expect to be asked and issues that you think will come up in the argument. On the left side, you may have some information about certain key cases that are likely to come up during the course of your argument, such as the facts, the holding, the date of the case, and other details that would be helpful to refresh your memory if you are asked about a case in your oral argument. And this format allows you room to place a post-it note or two of things that may occur to you while your oral argument is going on or more particularly while your opponent is arguing. Using an oral argument folder such as this one allows you to have a lot of information at your fingertips, but it is also very easy to refer to this information in a calm, discreet way without distracting the court. You might also use a binder, such as a trial binder, for your oral argument. It would be best to have the contents of this tabbed with numbered or lettered tabs along the side so that you can easily flip to different parts of your, of your, the different parts during the course of your argument. You may also want to bring parts of the record 
or a stipulation of facts or other documents to have them available at the podium during your oral argument. The idea is to make sure you don't bring too much material so that whatever you have is easily accessible and it won't cause a lot of fuss or noise during your oral argument. Excuse me, Counsel. Doesn't the Bickle case argue against your position? Oh, oh, yeah. You're quite right. You're quite well. No, actually, Your Honor, the uh, the Bickle case is a um, it's a it's a very interesting case. The the Bickle case is a uh, but the but oh here yes oh the Bickle case is against my no it isn't against my position, Your Honor. The next topic is how to stand at the podium. Easy enough. You simply stand there. But in fact, you have several choices to make, and you want to choose a position that you're comfortable with and that you will remain comfortable with for at least 10 or 15 minutes. Some available options are the following. The first is the fig leaf, with both hands clasped over the groin, with your hands placed straight down against your sides. Next, we have the commander of the ship, with your hands comfortably placed on each side of the podium. Next, we have the salesman, with one hand at your side and the other hand free for small gestures. And then there's at ease, soldier, with your hands clasped behind your back. This is a position that you're comfortable with and that you can maintain for the entire length of your argument, 10 or 15 minutes. The idea is not to distract the court by moving around too much or by putting an unacceptable appearance. The following positions are unacceptable and you should avoid them if you can where you are gripping the sides of the podium hard and leaning your full weight on the podium. So there's the orchestra leader, in an emphatic way trying to make a number of points, but really just distracting the court by all that excessive hand movement. Next, there's the preacher. As if delivering a sermon to the bench, this person will point emphatically at the court. There's devil may care, with one hand in the pocket. And then there's I could care less, with both hands in the pocket. Then there's the wanderer. During a moot court or an appellate argument, it is really not appropriate to leave the podium as if you are delivering a closing argument in a trial. Probably the best position is what I call the rail hanger. That's where you stand at the podium with your hands quietly placed on the edge of the rail. This is not only comfortable and gives your hands a place to be where they won't distract you or the court, it also allows you to refer your materials in a calm, collected, and non-distracting way. There is a formal way to start any oral argument. You should start with the phrase, may it please the court, then introduce yourself and introduce whatever side that you're representing. You might also give a sentence introducing the purpose of the oral argument, especially if you are going first. For example, May it please the court. Good afternoon, your honors. My name is Michael Murray. I'm representing the defendant, and we are here today to move for summary judgment on each count of the plaintiff's complaint. The oral argument is to deliver your argument in a calm, conversational tone. Don't rush. Cut. The facts of the case indicate that the defendant gave consent to the procedure. In fact, she gave consent twice. First on October 30th in Shanghai, and again on November 19th in San Francisco that you sound strange. Remember, it's a conversational tone that you're looking for. A due process dictate that this case must be reversed. Get carried away with emotion. You can be enthusiastic about your oral argument, but you shouldn't look like a fire and brimstone preacher. Cut. Case is an outrage. My client must be set free. There is no precedent for the way that the prosecution has treated my client in this case. The court away from your argument by banging the podium or making any noise. This case can be distinguished from Smith v. Jones because in that case, Jones never gave any advance consent for the procedure. Get your hands down. Do the real thing of personal hygiene during your argument. For instance, don't scratch your head or rub your ear. The record reveals that the police questioned the defendant, Smith, for over an hour. At no time did Smith ever assert his Miranda rights to have an attorney present. 
One officer even asked him if he wanted an attorney, and he said no. Problem. The record reveals. And as a conversation, you are inviting the court to engage in a dialogue with you about your case. It is best to engage in eye-to-eye -eye contact with someone when you are in a polite conversation. So try to make eye contact with the court whenever possible during your oral argument. The following can be very distracting and therefore not very convincing about specific performance is that this case involves an unconsented medical procedure and it is an invasive, evasive procedure. My client has withdrawn her consent to undergo the procedure even if she gave it at the time of contracting. Instead, try to make eye contact as often as you can. Your Honors, this is a case of first impression in this circuit. The last time a topic related to organ donation came up in the Ninth Circuit was in 1992 in the Smith v. Board of Regents case. The issues in that case was the use or misuse of a cell line derived from blood samples taken from Mr. Smith in the course of his treatment. Try to avoid verbal fillers as much as possible. I'm talking about phrases such as, uh, you know, well, that people use when they're speaking and they're trying to remember a phrase, but they, instead of leaving some dead air time, they try to insert it with a phrase such as, uh, or ah. Uh. None of these are very impressive and they can be very distracting in an oral argument. Case of first impression in this circuit. Uh, you know, the last time this topic, or a topic related to, you know, this organ donation, came up in this circuit was in 1992. And, okay, the Smith Board of Regents case where... Uh, the most important part of oral argument are the questions from the panel and your responses to those questions. Remember that oral argument is all about the judges. It's not about you presenting a speech. The judges will have questions and you should be prepared to respond to those questions as quickly and competently as you can. They may ask you questions about the facts of the case or individual cases that are involved in your argument. They could ask you about public policy or other concerns that come up. Remember that these questions are your friend. You should expect to get questions, you should expect to be interrupted, and you should never show annoyance or being bothered by put, being put off your script. Give it a few seconds. The second point I wish to make this afternoon... Uh, before you go there, counsel, I want to ask you something. How can this court grant specific performance of an invasive medical procedure against the will of the defendant? Okay, we'll go there. Specific performance is appropriate because we have to show that consent was given. The second point I wish to make this afternoon uh, is Before that you go there, counsel, I want to ask you something. How can this court grant specific performance of an invasive medical procedure against the will of the defendant? Your Honor, this is an important issue, because at first blush, it does sound like as if the court is ordering this procedure without the consent of the defendant. But in fact, consent was given on three occasions. When you are not speaking and you're sitting at the counsel table, remember to behave yourself. There's no backstage in a courtroom. Bear in mind about specific performance in this case, that it involves an unconsented medical procedure, and it is an invasive medical procedure. My client has withdrawn her consent to undergo the procedure, even if she first gave it at the time of contracting. The defendant did participate in the Designer Jeans website, but she was not actively peddling her ova for eight months, as plaintiff has suggested. Don't give away too much during your opponent's argument. Try to keep a good poker face. Don't let them know that they have made a good point by the reaction on your face. This is a case of first impression in this circuit. The last time a topic related to organ donation came up in the Ninth Circuit was in Smith versus Board of Regents. There, the issue was the use or misuse of a cell line derived from blood samples taken from Mr. Smith in the course of his treatment. The last time a topic related to organ donation came up in the Ninth Circuit was in 1992 in Smith versus Board of Regents. The issue in that case was the use or misuse of a cell line derived from blood samples taken from Mr. Smith during the course of his treatment. In the remainder of this video, being in first year oral argument or competing in an upper division moot court competition, you will want to know how the judges will score your performance. The following segments are from a video entitled, Winning Moot Court Competitions, Techniques to Excel, copyright 1995 by Major Dynamics Corporation. 
This video features Scott Major, who is an attorney and a former champion in, in moot court competitions. He will explain the scoring process and several other aspects of the moot court competition. This is how we measure the experience of moot court. It's broken into several categories. Scoring is done by the judges, and this is their way of sending you a message as to the merit of your argument. It is broken into categories. Different score sheets have different subsections, but the general sections you should be concerned are evidence of research, performance in answering questions, responsiveness to the opponent's arguments, and forensics. If we look at each one of those sections, we will be able to see how your argument should be molded. Evidence of research. Questions that are often asked of the judges when they're reviewing your argument is, does counsel give a brief overview of his or her argument, including the important issues? Does counsel have a thorough knowledge of the record and applicable law? Were counsel's comments and arguments organized, clear, direct? How does one answer questions? This is one of the most important sections they answer yes or no? When appropriate, did counsel properly respond or were they evasive? Did you answer yes or no or did you try to get around that question? And the segue concepts of did counsel use those questions and answers to bolster their argument, to return back into where they were? So it appears as though you anticipated the questions. Was counsel candid about the weak points in the case? often referred to as the art of concession. Did counsel use reason and logic rather than relying solely on precedent? Have you looked at the policy implications of what you're doing and applied logic and reason to the facts and the law of your case? Did you respond to the opponent's arguments? And that is a response both on the appellee side when he or she responds to the appellant's argument and on rebuttal when you, as the individual, get an opportunity to respond to the appellee's arguments. Did you concern yourself with the policy considerations and what the effect of what you're asking the court to do will have on the decision? Courts are going to ask you that question very often. Counsel, what do we have to do? And those are questions which we're going to deal with. Forensics. Did counsel properly introduce him or herself to the court and identify your client? Did you speak in a clear and concise manner? Did you maintain a professional manner? Or did you become flustered when you were questioned? Did you maintain eye contact with the entire court throughout the presentation, both in your argument and in the questions? When a question comes from the court, it is from the entire court, not just from one judge. Many different styles of presenting an oral argument, and each can be successful if it's comfortable for you, the person who is delivering the oral argument. In the following segment, Scott Major presents his view of what is an effective presentation of an argument and makes quite a few valid points. I will comment that Scott Major has a very deliberate oral argument delivery style in which he allows for dramatic pauses and he also uses emphatic hand gestures quite a bit when he is making his oral argument. This style may not work for you if you're more comfortable with a more conversational style and a less, shall we say, dramatic or a style of an actor, then please adopt a style that's comfortable to you. But pay attention to the more substantive points that he's making in the following segment. Now it's time to take the step from the introduction, the opening, and segue it into an effective presentation of your oral argument. In order to effectively communicate your position, you need to have a command of both the facts and the relevant law, as well as the law which works against you. In the context of your argument, make sure that you are very clear, clean, and that you follow those points which you have itemized in your request. In our given situation, 
Mr. Thompson wants to terminate life support and die with dignity. I need to establish his right to die. So I've completed the facts. I take a pause and I say, the Constitution gives an individual a right to make medical decisions about their life. This is based upon the right of privacy that came out of the Roe versus Wade case and the Constitution's first, second, fourth, fifth, and ninth amendments. The Constitution and the developing case law has extended this right to allow individuals who are in a comatose, brain dead, vegetative position to make medical decisions terminating their life support. Now what I've done is I've set up for the panel exactly the legal basis for our case. Now I begin to apply the facts. Mr. Thompson is comatose, brain dead, and vegetative. This has been determined by three doctors. Page 27 of the record. Great opportunity for you to inject a record site, collect a lot of scoring points, because what you've done is let them know that you know about the record. Inevitably, in the context of your argument, you are going to be faced with questions from the bench. When fielding pitches from the court, make sure you know the difference between a softball that you can hit for a home run and a hand grenade. 